news today. Washington Journal continues. Joining us this morning from the Cannon Rotunda office building up on Capitol Hill is the top Democrat of the Education and the Workforce Committee in the House, Representative Bobby Scott of Virginia. Thank you, sir, for being here and joining us for this conversation about education. We want our viewers to call in and tell us this morning what changes they would make to education policy and then get your reaction to that. So I'll kick off the conversation before we get to calls with just a question about the Every Student Succeeds Act. It replaced No Child Left Behind. Remind our viewers what the differences are or were between those, those two laws. Well, the primary difference is that we, one of the complaints against No Child Left Behind was just too much testing. The Every Student Succeeds Act removed every test possible, but, we, but you have to have enough tests to ascertain whether or not there are any achievement gaps, and if so, you have to um, uh, try to get rid of the achievement gaps. You have to have some tests to make that, uh, that, that assessment. The problem with No Child Left Behind was there were tests, uh, too many tests, and the uh, people were teaching to the test and uh, became much of an aggravation. We gave a lot more um, local authority to ascertain how you're going to do the assessment and a lot of more local authority to uh, see how you're going to cure your achievement gaps. But we did not relieve them of the responsibility to do the assessment and be accountable for removing the achievement gaps. So will students and teachers feel the impact of Every Student Succeeds this year? Uh, it, there, we're in the process of uh, making the changes. Uh, there should be uh, fewer tests this year. Um, uh, and, and hopefully the um, assessment and the response. One of the problems is uh, with No Child Left Behind is it had just a couple of um, uh, strategies for uh, addressing the achievement gap and some of them didn't apply to the situation, didn't work. We've given more local authority to have tailor-made um, uh, strategies to eliminate the achievement gap so they should be seeing some uh, some changes this year, yes. And how will this law be rolled out? How will it be implemented? Well, What's the government's it, it, role? It's, well, the federal government gave more authority to localities. Localities are going through now to see what they can do to make the assessments more, uh, more practical and how they can actually achieve the, uh, the reduction or elimination of the achievement gaps. You first of all have to figure out what your local problem is, uh, why some groups are falling behind, and then you have to come up with a strategy to do something about it. There are a lot of very effective strategies. Some work in uh, Montana may not work in Chicago, some work in Florida may not work in Virginia. So you have to see what works in your locality, uh, but you have to assess what the achievement gaps are and you have to have a strategy for dealing with it. Before we get to calls then, Congressman, what's missing from this law? What still needs to be addressed in your opinion? Well, I think it's, we, we have a pretty good law. I mean, we, we have the uh, requirement to do the assessment and eliminate achievement gaps. We have set high standards. Uh, someone graduating from high school, for example, uh, should be able to get into a state college without remedial courses. Uh, we've set high standards, uh, and I think we're in pretty good shape. It's up to the states and localities to implement the law. And we're very excited about the um, uh, prospects. All right. Well, let's talk to viewers back in their states about education policy and the changes they would make. Leo in Lafayette, Louisiana, Independent. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead, sir, with your question. My question is, well, I have a comment and a question. My comment is, uh, I agree with the gentleman. And one of the proposals, I think, that... Uh, politicians need to focus on is lowering the cost of higher education. And the final result of lowering higher education should be free higher education. Higher education is too high and it causes a disparity and that's what ignorant Americans want. The time for the past America is over. We need an America that looks like the rest of the world and free education will give you that. Okay, but Leo, let's, let's have the congressman respond to that. Well, I think it's very important that uh, higher education be available to everyone. We know from studies that most of the jobs in the, in the uh, near future will require education past the high school level. 
not necessarily a four-year college, but some education or training past the high school level. And so it's important that higher education be available. He's right, it's too expensive. Um, one of the problems is that a few decades ago, the states would, would spend enough money to cover about two-thirds of the cost of a four-year college education. Now they're only putting up enough for about one-third of the cost of the college education. Uh, the Pell Grant used to cover about 75 percent of the cost. Uh, now it's um, uh, about a third. The rest is student loans, and a lot of uh, students, unfortunately, are calculating that they can't afford to go to college. Well, that people who are academically qualified, ready to pursue higher education, and don't go because they can't afford it. That is devastating to our future competitiveness as a nation. So the gentleman is absolutely right. We have to significantly reduce reduce the cost, and we're making and we're making choices. Um, uh, free state college was. Um, uh, was priced at about $900 billion. Um, that's a lot of money, but it's not so much when you consider a few years ago we passed the extension of the Bush tax cuts. That cost $3.9 trillion. $0.9 trillion is $900 billion. We could have had a $3 trillion tax cut and enough for free college. Uh, there are other proposals to make a community college free, uh, to make a college debt free, uh, there are a lot of other uh, proposals, but he's absolutely right. We have to get the cost down, and it's just a matter of making choices. Um, uh, education ought to be a very high priority. For our conversation with the congressman this morning, we've divided the lines by parents, 202-748-8000, teachers and administrators, we want to hear from you, 202-748-8001, and all others, 202-748-8002. Let's hear from Lorraine, who's administrator in Snow Hill, Maryland. Good morning. Oh, I need to correct that. I am not in the system at present. I used to be in the... Um, I, anyway, let me go back to my, what I've got to say. What I am saying is that I, I listen at them um, speaking and, and going to college, but how are you going to go to college? College costs presently based on the fact that we're doing so much remedial teaching at the college level. And so you're preparing the kids before they can even go forward. So if we have to do that in, in the, at the college. You know your expenses are increased because now you're teaching what they should have gotten at the high school level. Con Congressman, what do you think about that? Well, she's absolutely right, and that's why we increased the standards under the Every Student Succeeds Act to make sure that someone who graduates from high school will be able to get into a state college without remediation. When you have to take the remedial courses, obviously it stretches out the time that you have to be in, in college, stretches out the cost uh, for you being in college. And so she's absolutely right. The, uh, the states have the obligation to set standards and set a graduation standard so that when they get to college, they won't have to take the remedial courses. Mark is watching us in Norfolk, Virginia. Parent, hi, Mark. Hey, good morning, and good morning, uh, Congressman Scott, my favorite congressperson. Good morning. <laughs> hey, good. Look, Congressman, uh, you know, as a parent involved in the PTA, uh, what is happening across the board? is that, you know, I think the Democrats have an argument, the Republicans have a legitimate argument, in that the government really is too fat and bureaucratic. And what it's doing is spilling over into the school systems. And what you have because of the low pay of teachers, the actual better teachers are just fleeing the classroom for administrative positions and principalships. And a lot of the teachers that are still trying to hold their ground in the classroom, they don't feel like they have the autonomy that they used to have in order to run their classroom uh, the way that they need to run it. And I think what's happened is the best practices theory is actually being snuffed out because you actually have, you know, some very, very super duper teachers. But they just feel, I mean, they're afraid to lose their job. It's almost like, you know, uh, in, in a few school systems that I'm very familiar with, a lot of teachers basically just enter the classroom in fear. They're catching it from the students, and then they're also catching it from the administrators. All right, and thanks, Mark. Congressman. Well, I think he's absolutely right. I think we could start with higher teacher salaries. Higher salaries would attract uh, better students. When you're in college, 
you look at the professions that pay better, and those are the professions that the better students uh, try to compete in. Uh, when you have um, uh, very low salaries, you don't get the best students going into teaching. And so that's one of the um, ways you can attract and retain uh, much better, higher quality teachers. And if you look at the um, successful countries around the world, those that do well in education, you'll see that they pay their teachers as professionals and give them more latitude. When you have the lower salaries, it's um, more challenging to give the latitude because some need uh, much more prescriptive directions. Uh, so um, if you could start off with, uh, with higher salaries, he's absolutely right. Lowell, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Probably over 100 million illegal immigrants, not 10, as always has been said. The cost of that has destroyed almost everything in the nation for education. As far as teachers attempting to get principalships and uh, administrative, they don't qualify. And when, also, teachers can't be fired. Cell phones in classrooms with teachers turning their backs on students and texting while students are t getting paperwork torn out of books and doing busy work is a consistent thing across all teachers should be videotaped. And that would increase the quality of our education to an extent that would blow everybody's mind. Uh, the cost of illegal immigration to our nation in education is outrageous. I know many teachers, they say that the SAT qualifications are put on them, and then they have to also attempt to teach these illegal immigrants who they can't ask whether they're illegal immigrants or not. You have to teach them, get through the barrier of them not even being able to to speak English. And when they can, half of them are pretending to know much more than they know in English. As, a, as repetition is the mother of skill, and they will eventually realize it. Maybe three or four generations. We didn't get in this mess overnight, and we're not going to get that out of it overnight. It's going to take at least four years to get out of this. Thanks for taking my call. Good day. Congressman, do you agree, disagree? Well, I think he has uh, made a case for, for comprehensive immigration reform. Um, uh, once the people are here, you have a choice of whether you're going to educate them or not. My view is that you're better off, since they're here, educating them uh, so that the children grow up, grow up educated and much less likely uh, to be involved in crime, much less likely to cause problems. Um, failing to educate them, I think, would cause uh, more problems then you have then, then um, failing to educate them would cause more problems than educating the young people. Uh, but he has made a case for comprehensive immigration reform, which is obviously the subject of uh, uh, a, d a different subject. Richard in California, up early, a parent. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, um, I would just like to express um, my story of what happened with my son. He um, went to high school, honor student did all his A2G requirements for the state of California, got accepted at uh, UC or uh, Riverside. It's a state college, but um, I know that the gentleman was saying on TV something about like local challenges, state challenges. I'm not sure if it was a challenge or not, but my son received a D in his first semester of the senior year in a class that wasn't even a required class to go to college, and he got redacted. He can't go now. And it's upsetting as a parent because He's been discouraged, and now he has to go to junior college. But the funding was there; everything was going on. And I was wondering um, what the congressman thinks of what's going on in his state, and is this like different in each state? And I also just want to put the word out there to the seniors this year: please make sure you know what your college, especially university, state uh, requirements are, because you might just get left behind. Okay, Thank Richard, you. Congressman. Well, some of the colleges, you, you, you talked about Virginia, some have, um, are very competitive, where much better mm -hmm. grades give you a much better chance of getting in. Others are virtual open, open enrollment, especially the community colleges. Uh, it's important if you want to go to a competitive college that you get um, the best grades. Uh, if you get a high school diploma, you can at least go to community college and continue your education, do well, get back on track, and then transfer to a four-year college. In Virginia, virtually all of the colleges have uh, articulation agreements where you can uh, transfer your credits from the first two years in community college to your four-year degree. Congressman, I want to get your thoughts on this front page story in the New York Times this morning. Connecticut is told to start over as a judge faults its schools. 
in a decision that could fundamentally reshape public education in the state of Connecticut. The state was ordered on Wednesday to make changes in everything from how schools are financed to which students are eligible to graduate from high school to how teachers are paid and evaluated. The judge's decision was a response to a lawsuit filed more than a decade ago that claimed the state was shortchanging the poorest district when it came to school funding. And the New York Times says what separates the decision from those in dozens of similar suits around the country is that rather than addressing money only, it requires the state to rethink nearly every major aspect of its system. Well, that, um, I'm not familiar with the details of the case, but that analysis is um, part of what we're trying to do, do, do in Washington. We started with the Brown v. Board of Education case. It is said that it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if denied the opportunity of an education. Such an opportunity is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms. We fund it generally with the real estate tax, which guarantees that it's not going to be equal. Um, Elementary and Secondary Education Act in 1965 put money into areas uh, of, of uh, concentrated poverty to try to make up for that uh, obviously obvious disparity and No Child Left Behind with all its faults did add on the requirement that not only do you have to get the money straight you have to get the results straight you can't have certain groups chronically behind um, and so if you have achievement gaps you have to do something about it now the the solution to that is not just money um, it may uh, teach your salaries obviously if you if you're paying extremely low salaries in reality, you're not going to get all of the highest quality teachers. You'll get some, but you won't get all of them. If you paid doctors $40,000 a year, your hospital could find some doctors, but you wouldn't be able to staff the entire hospital if that's all you're paying paying doctors. We need to pay our teachers more. So looking at it as a comprehensive approach, uh, is the way to that's the way to um, improve education. I'm not familiar with the Connecticut case, uh, but that kind of analysis, getting the money straight and making sure that the um, uh, you have the best teachers in the most challenging schools, and you deal with achievement gaps. That's and, and there's no one um, one what one strategy that works. Uh, some some have shown that you have wraparound services. Uh, children, particularly in low-income areas, can come in with many, uh, many challenges, um, uh, and you have to deal with them. If they're homeless, if they're hungry, uh, they're not going to be able to learn, and you may have to deal with those, uh, with those problems. Congressman, let's get in another call. Agnes in Fairview, Oklahoma. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. The uh, education of a child is the most important thing that this country can do. But when they're at the mercy of a state that will whack into education funds to try and balance a budget, they're only going to be hurting the future generation of this country. I live here in Oklahoma and have watched massive, massive uh, screw-ups here in our education system. The governor gave tax cuts to corporations to try and bring in business, and then when the oil prices dropped out, that left a budget shortfall, and they whacked education. We have schools now that do not have enough teachers. They are running to a four-day teaching week. These kids are not going to get the education that they need. We are going to be raising a future generation of ignorant people if this doesn't straighten out. Kansas to the north has done the same thing. Their education system has been whacked to death by the local government with their, their legislatures hacking to balance budgets. This is something that we need to take a look at at the federal level as well. These kids should not be at the mercy of their local governments. Thank you for taking my call. Well, the Every, Every Student Succeed Act requires them to have high standards so that when, people, when children graduate from high school, they're able to go to a four-year state college. They're, they're, they're qualified, and so you have to have teachers qualified enough to um, uh, to educate the children, but it, but the uh, caller was absolutely right. We make choices uh, when you give tax cuts and then end up paying for them with cuts in education. That has long-term implications in the, in the uh, future workforce and the education of the children and the quality of education. I mean, the, these are choices that are made, and when you choose tax cuts and you choose to pay for them with cuts in education, uh, you pay for it later on. 
Congressman, before we let you go, uh, Washington Post front page story is about you this morning with the headline, Virginians could make history again if the governor were to appoint you to fill out Senator Tim Kaine's seat if Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine win the general election. The first African American to serve in, you are the first African American to serve in Congress from Virginia since the 1890s. Mr. Scott would again break the color barrier if Governor McAuliffe appoints him as the first black senator from your state. But the story goes on to say that there's some concern that you haven't run statewide before and that you haven't been able to, um, that you haven't been, you haven't had a competitive race and that there's concerns that you wouldn't be able to raise the money needed for a statewide race. Do you think you could do it? Well, yes, and if you have raised enough money by win, by I've raised enough money to win all of my races by at least 38 percentage points, uh, and so um, there's an old joke that um, Jack Kennedy, and I think it's in the article, uh, Jack Kennedy called his father and wanted more money for um, for an election, and his father essentially told him, um, uh, Jack, uh, I don't mind buying an election, but I'm not paying for a landslide. I've raised enough money. I think once in the last 20 some years, I've won about less than 40 points, and that was 38 points. And so I've raised enough money to win, um, uh, to even pay for landslides. Uh, if um, appointed by the governor, we'll have to run in, in 2017 and 2018. And um, I'm prepared to do that. All right. Well, Congressman, we appreciate your time this morning and talking to our viewers uh, about education. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're going to continue here.